All right. Welcome, everyone, to today's Google SEO office hours. My name is John Mueller. I'm a search advocate at Google here in Switzerland. And part of what we do are these office hour hangouts, where people can jump in and ask their questions around their website and web search. And we could try to find some answers. Um, as always, a bunch of stuff was submitted on YouTube, so we can go through some of, the, some of that. But if any of you want to get started with the first question, you're welcome to, to jump in. Hi, John. Uh, I have a question. Um, sure. So this question is regarding to uh, e-commerce. So um, there is uh, a lot of e-commerce uh, pages. They have like a refined pages, right? Uh, so they will be a pages that uh, they will put a certain amount of product in the page based on a predefined logic to show up those product in those pages. And those pages that uh, I, um, in my case, uh, I have a client. It's a very good pages to capture long tail keywords because they are like refined saying that, for example, computer and at the same time have AMD chips, things like that. And when people are searching for long tail keyword like computer AMD uh, processor, um, those pages are very good um, place to capture them. However, uh, so so here come my question is. Um, for those pages, uh, they are some kind of design that people will. Uh, they are some kind of design that uh, uh, they, they because they automatically assign product, right? And uh, you can't put all the product in the first pa first rendering of those that kind of pages. So every time when there's new product adding into the inventory or some product is removed from the inventory, the page content of first rendering product will change. And I, I, I will send an example here uh, in the comment section. For example, this is not my client, but it's uh, because I'm not allowed to show my client website, but it's a similar situation. So when you click into that link, uh, you go into, you, you can see that they are a, 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 a lot of product in the page, but when you scroll down to the bottom, they will have load more. So people only see the product that before load more, right? And whenever we add inventory into uh, the product or remove something, the first rendering product will change. So Google will constantly seeing different content of that page. Will they confuse Google? Uh, how do we solve this problem? That's that's essentially fine. That's that's totally normal. I think with with e-commerce, with a very busy site. You, you have those kind of shifts all the time. Uh, with news websites, you have it similar, that you have news articles all the time. And when you look at the home page of a news site, like there are always different articles that are linked there. And uh, from our point of view, that's fine. The important part, I think, especially with e-commerce, is that we're able to find the individual product pages themselves. Uh, so somewhere along the line, we need to have kind of persistent links to those products. Uh, so that could be on, on that page. It could be on page two or page three or page four of that listing, something like that. Uh, so that's kind of the, the important part there. I wouldn't worry that the pages change when from load to load. Uh, because what will happen from, from a search point of view is we will recognize there, there's specific content for this topic on this page. And uh, we'll try to bring queries to the page that kind of match the, the general topic. And if like a computer model one or a computer model two is shown there, and they're essentially equivalent because they're in the same category of, of product, then that doesn't really change much for us. So uh, what are your, uh, from what I heard is that as long as the logic of assigning product is consistent and the product is showing up in the first rendering match the, for example, title tag on the page, then that is fine. But if the, the, the logic is like not consistent and they suddenly have other product, then there will be a problem. Yeah. So, so for example, if you have a clothing store and you have a category that's just blue, and the category blue has everything from socks to jackets and everything in between, then it's really hard for us to say, this is a landing page for this type of product. Uh, so we will. Like we will constantly be confused by a page like that. Whereas if it's a landing page about, um, I don't know, blue jackets, for example, like category jackets and color blue, then it's it doesn't really matter which jackets you show there; they all match that intent, and it's pretty clear to the user like they they fit into that category. So as long as this product, uh, new adding product, are still blue jacket, even if different blue jacket in the first rendering and the content is changed, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. But if there is like one time there's a red jacket adding to that product, there will be a problem. 
I, I think like individual cases is absolutely no problem. If it's always something random in there, then it, it gets hard for us to understand the pattern. Okay, thank you so much. Sorry sure. for taking some time. Hey, John. Uh, Hi. Thank you. My question is regarding image search and uh, why one image might be shown preference over another. Uh, specifically, uh, it's on a product page. Uh, that uses like an image slider uh, to display pictures of the product. And considering that pretty much everything is nearly identical, uh, like alt text, file name, uh, nearby text mentions, weight, things of that nature, um, why might a kind of seemingly random image from within like the slider sequence, maybe third or fourth thumbnail, uh, be shown preference over like a featured image? like usually the first image that you would see on a product page. Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's, is it, it's hard to say. I, I don't think, so, so we have various things that kind of go into image search. And on the one hand, it is kind of the aspects that you mentioned, like the, the titles of the page, the image file name, the captions, alt text, things like that. Um, but we, we do also have some, some logic that tries to understand, like, is this a high quality image or not? And it's, it, it's possible. I, I don't know those images that our systems are either getting confused by, by the contents of the image or that they, they like, clearly see like, one image is significantly higher quality than the other. And for us, then maybe we would show it a little bit more visibly like that. Uh, but uh, it's it's something where I think there there are always a number of different factors that play into that, and uh, even for multiple images on the same page, which are kind of in the same category of uh, things, it's it's possible that we kind of show them in one order once and show them in a different order another time. Okay, so are you are you able to comment on this? Uh... I imagine that uh, cloud vision has something to do with that, trying to match similarities with machine learning to the entities. Am I on the right track here? Um, I, I don't know how far we, we would use something like that. I, I, I do think, at least as far as I understand, we, we've talked about doing that in the past, uh, specifically for image search. but. It's something where just purely based on the contents of the image alone, it's sometimes really hard to determine how the, the relevance should be for a specific query. Uh, so for example, you might have, I don't know, a picture of a beach. And we could recognize, oh, it's, it's a beach. There's water here, things like that. Uh, but if someone is searching for a hotel, is like a picture of the beach the relevant thing to show? Or is that, I don't know, a couple miles away from the hotel? It's, it's really hard to, to judge just based on the contents of the image alone. So I, I imagine uh, if or, or when we do use kind of uh, machine learning to understand the contents of the image, it's something auxiliary to the other factors that we have. So it's not that it would completely override everything else. Got you. Thank you. Sure. Uh, John, just one follow up on this. Does Google have any plan of machine learning auto detection of what is happening in uh, what is there in picture? Because I am saying that different devices also have this kind of feature. Does Google also have uh, any plan of implementing this kind of feature? What what is happening with within the image? I I don't know. Um, kind of like with, with the previous question, it's something where it's it's certainly possible to some extent to to pull out some additional image information from an image which could be like objects in the image or what what is happening in the image uh, but i don't know if that would override any of the other factors that we have there uh, so it's my my understanding is this is probably something that would be more kind of on the side if we have multiple images that we think are kind of equivalent and we can clearly tell somehow that this one is more relevant because it has, I don't know, the, the objects or the actions that uh, someone is searching for. And maybe we would use that. But I, 
I honestly don't know what we've announced in that uh, in that area or uh, what we're actually using for search there. Because the the thing to keep in mind is that there are a lot of different elements that that are theoretically possible that might be done kind of in consumer devices. Uh, there are lots of things that are patented that are out there that are kind of like theoretically possible. Uh, but just because it's possible in some instances doesn't mean that it makes sense for search. And uh, we, we see that a lot with, with patents when it comes to search, where someone will patent a, a really cool uh, algorithm or setup that could have an implication for search. But just because it's patented from Google and maybe even from someone who works on search doesn't mean that we actually use it in search. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Sure. OK, uh, let me run through some of the submitted questions. And uh, if you have questions along the way, feel free to jump in. And we'll almost certainly have time towards the end for more questions from all of you. All right, uh, the first question is about Google Discover. Uh, one of the sites I'm running is about anime, fan arts, cosplay, fan fiction, was performing fairly well in Discover. Uh, but one day to another, the traffic dropped to zero without any significant change on the site. In Google Search, it's growing uh, before and after that. What kind of problems could bring that situation? Um, I don't know. It's, it's really hard to say with, without looking at the site. But in, in general, when it comes to Google Discover, one of the things that uh, I've noticed from, from feedback from folks uh, like you all is that uh, the traffic tends to be very kind of on or off, in that our systems might think, well, it makes sense to show this more in Discover. And then suddenly, you, you get a lot of traffic from Discover. Uh, and then our algorithms might at some point say, well, it doesn't make sense to show it that much in Discover anymore, and the traffic goes away. And especially with Discover, it's something which is not tied to a specific query. So it's really hard to say it's like what you should be expecting, because you don't know how many people are kind of interested in this topic or where we would potentially be able to show that. Uh, so that's something where if, if you do see a lot of visibility from Google Discover, I think that's fantastic. I just would be careful and kind of realize that this is something that can change fairly quickly. Uh, additionally, we also, for Discover, we have a, a Help Center article that goes into Pretty deep, pretty much detail what, what kind of things we watch out for, uh, and in particular, what, what kind of things we, we don't want to show and discover. Uh, so that's something that you might want to double check. Um, depending on, I, I guess, the site that you have, you, that's something that might be more relevant or less relevant there. But uh, I would definitely check that out. Uh, what are the levels of site quality demotions? Is there like a first level where everything site-wide looks fine, no demotion? Second level, uh, you demote some pages that are not relevant. Or third level, site-wide is not good at all. Um, so from, from my understanding is we, we don't have kind of these different levels of uh, site-wide demotion where we would say, it's like we need to demote everything on the website, or we don't don't need to demote anything on the website. I, I think, depending on the website, you, you might see aspects like this or might feel like aspects like this. But uh, for, for the most part, we, we do try to look at it as granular as possible. And in some cases, we can't look at it as granular as possible. So we'll look at kind of like different chunks of a website. Uh, so that's something where, from, from our side, it's not so much that we have different categories. And we just say it's like in this category or in that category. It's just uh, there is almost like a, a fluid transition uh, across the web. And also, when it comes to things where our algorithms might say, oh, we, we don't really know how to trust this, it's, uh, for, for the most part, it's not a matter of trust is there or trust is not there. It's like yes or no. But rather, we, we have this really kind of fluid transition where we think, well, we, we're not completely sure about this, but it makes sense for these kind of queries, for example, or it makes sense for these kind of queries. Uh, so that's something where there's like a, a lot of uh, a lot of room. Um, 
Let's see. I have a question about omitted results. We published two large dot coms, uh, horoscope and astrology, each with each own URL and content teams. After ranking on the first page for astrology queries for multiple years, uh, in February last year, only one of the sites began to show up for normal search results at a time. Whichever site has the highest ranking for a given query uh, will show up, with the other site being classified as an omitted result. Um, there's no duplicate content or cross links between the sites. So I'm curious why this is happening. Uh, it's, it's really hard to say without uh, looking at the specific sites and looking at the specific situation. Uh, so usually with two websites, if they're not completely the same, then we would rank them individually, even if there is kind of like an ownership relationship there. Um, so from that point of view, it might also just be something that is kind of not, not related to, to what you're suspecting in that, uh, that our algorithms think that it's like the same site, and we should only show one of these at the same time. Uh, it, I, I have seen situations where if there are a large number of sites uh, that are involved, a large number of domains, that our algorithms might say, well, all of these domains are essentially the same content. And we should just pick one of these to show rather than like all of these. Uh, but usually, if, if there are two websites and they're kind of unique in their own ways, then that's something where we would try to show them individually. Uh, so I, I think from, from a practical point of view, what I would do here is go to the Webmaster Help Forums and uh, post the details, what you're seeing here, maybe some screenshots, uh, specific URLs and queries uh, where you're seeing this happening. And uh, the folks there can take a look at that and maybe guide you into, I don't know, if there's something specific that you could be doing differently there, maybe they can point you at that. Or maybe they can point you in the direction of saying, well, it is how it is. That's nothing kind of unnatural that's happening there. Um, but also, the, the folks active in the help forums have the ability to escalate things to, to Google Teams. So if they think this is really weird, and maybe something weird is happening on Google's side, then they can escalate that to someone at Google. Um, let's see. Does Google Search consider each URL of a website individually? For example, does a low score on a domain homepage have any effect on the other pages which have a high score? Uh, so yeah, like, like I mentioned before, we try to be as granular as possible, as, as fine-grained as possible, in the sense that we try to focus on individual pages. But especially within a website, you're kind of always linking to the other pages of your website. So there is kind of a, a connection between all of these pages. And if one page is really bad, and we think that's the most important page for your website, then obviously that will have an effect on the other pages within your website, because they're all kind of in context of that one main page, for example. Uh, whereas if one page on your website is something that we would consider not so good, and it's some random part of your website, then that's not going to be the central point where everything evolves around. Then from our point of view, that's like, well, this one page is not so great, but that's, that's fine. It doesn't really affect the rest. Um, the mobile section of Core Web Vitals in Search Console shows a bad URL uh, on original link, while the AMP version of the same URL is a good URL. Uh, why are these two considered separately? Uh, so essentially, what happens there is that we don't focus so much on the theoretical aspect of this is an AMP page and there's a canonical here. Uh, but rather, we focus on the data that we see from actual users that go to these pages that navigate to them. Uh, so that's something where you might see an effect of lots of users are going to your website directly, and they're going to the non-AMP URLs, maybe, depending on how you have your website set up. Uh, and in Search, you have your AMP URLs. Then we probably will get signals or enough signals that we track them individually for both of those versions. So on the one hand, people going to search, going to the AMP versions, and people maybe going to your website directly, going to the non-AMP versions. And uh, in a case like that, we, we might see uh, information separately from those two versions. And uh, then kind of like we, we have those two versions and, and the data there. So we'll show that in Search Console like that. 
Uh, whereas if you set up your website in a way that you're consistently always working with the AMP version, uh, that maybe all mobile users go to the AMP version of your website, then that's something where we can like, clearly say, well, this is the primary version. We'll focus all of our signals on that version. Uh, the next question there is, since AMP is enabled, will Google Mobile Search consider only the AMP version, which passes the Core Web Vitals test when ranking the website, or will the original link also be considered? Um, so I, I mean, on, on the one hand, there is the aspect of, is it a valid AMP or not? If it's not a valid AMP, then we wouldn't show it. So that's, that's one aspect that goes into play there. Uh, but uh, I, I think in the theoretical situation that we have data for the non-AMP version and data for the AMP version, and we would show the AMP version in the search results, then we would use the, ver the data for the version that we show in search as the basis for, for the ranking. Uh, so in, in a case like that, where like, we, we clearly have data for both of these versions, and we would pick one of those versions to show, then we would use the data for that version. Uh, that's similar, I, I think, also with international websites where you have different uh, kind of URLs for individual countries. And if we have data for one version, we show that. Or if we have one version that we would show in the search results, and we have data for that version, then we'll use the data for that version, even if we have kind of other data for the other language or other country version. Yeah. I, and the, the only case where I know where we would fold things together is uh, with regards to the AMP cache, uh, because theoretically, the AMP cache is also located in yet another place, another set of URLs. Uh, but with the AMP cache, we, we know kind of how we should fold that back to the AMP version and track that data there. Uh, so that's, that's a little bit of an exception. But if you have kind of separate AMP versions and separate mobile versions on your site, then it's, it's very possible that we could track those individually. Um, does Google weigh the exact match title tag more in comparison to the title tag focused more on users? So let's say the phrase I want to rank for is Audi A3, and one version of the title tag is this exact match. The other version is. Uh, this car for sale, 152 great models. Uh, would this title be scored less relevant uh, for the query Audi A3 just because it is longer and not exact match? Um, I don't think we have any exact definition on how that would, would pan out in, in practice. Uh, so there's certainly an aspect of, does this title kind of match the query, but we also try to understand the relevance of the query. Uh, we try to understand things like synonyms or kind of more context around the query, around the titles as well. Uh, so I don't think there's, there's a sim simple kind of like exact match to the query is better or not exact match to the query is better there. Uh, so my, my recommendation there would be to test this out and just try it out. And not so much in terms of uh, SEO, like which one will rank better, but kind of think about like which one of these would work better in the search results. And uh, that's something you, you could try out on one page. You could try out uh, on multiple pages that are kind of set up in a similar way. And then based on that, you can determine, well, this one kind of attracts more clicks from users. It matches the intent that the user has better somehow. Uh, so I'll stick to that model and use that across the rest of my website. So that's kind of my, my recommendation there. I think with kind of the, the general information retrieval point of view of which one of these would be the better fit, uh, I imagine you could get into really long arguments uh, with uh, the people that are working on information retrieval on which one is better or not. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I don't think there is like this one, one clear answer. Uh, comments below the blog post. Are comments still a ranking factor? I'm migrating to another CMS and would like to get rid of all comments. Uh, about one to three not really relevant comments below many blog posts. Can I delete them safely without losing any ranking? Um, I, 
I think it's ultimately up to you. From, from our point of view, uh, we do see comments as a part of the content. We do also, in many cases, recognize that this is actually a comment section, so we need to treat it slightly differently. Uh, but ultimately, if uh, people are finding your pages based on the comments there, then if you delete those comments, then obviously we wouldn't be able to find your pages based on that. Uh, so that's something where, depending on the, the type of comments that you have there, the amount of comments that you have, it, it can be the case that they provide significant value to your pages, and it can be a source of additional kind of uh, information about your pages, but it, it's not always the case. Uh, so that's something where I think you kind of need to look at the, the contents of your pages overall, uh, the queries that are leading to your pages, and think about like which of these queries might go away if my comments were not on those pages anymore. And based on that, you can try to figure out like, what, what you need to do there. It's certainly not the case that we completely ignore all of the comments on a site. Uh, so just blindly going off and deleting all of your comments in the hope that nothing will change, I don't think that will happen. Uh, when using interstitials as product pages, does Google index the content on those interstitials, or does it only index the content on the static pages? Uh, so I wasn't quite sure how, how you use interstitials as product pages. That seems like a, a kind of unique setup. Uh, but anyway, I think it's, it's less a matter of kind of interstitials or not, uh, but more a matter of what content is actually shown when we load those pages. Uh, so if we load this HTML page and, by default, it always doesn't show any product, information, uh, then we wouldn't have that product information to actually index. Uh, whereas if you kind of load that page and it takes a second and then it pops up the full content, uh, the full product information, then essentially by loading the page, we have that information. And uh, we can use that to index and to rank those pages. Uh, so it's a kind of a simple way to double check uh, what we would be able to pick up with regards to indexing is to take that URL and use something like the mobile friendly test uh, or the ins URL inspection tool in Search Console and copy it in there and to see if Google is able to bring up the full product information or not. Uh, if Google can bring up the product information, then probably that's OK. Uh, whereas if Google only shows you kind of that the static page behind that, then probably it's the case that we wouldn't be able to pick up the product information there. Um, so that's that's kind of one thing to, to watch out for. I think what what threw me off with this question initially is also the, the word interstitials there, in the sense that usually interstitials are something that are kind of between uh, the content that you're looking for and uh, maybe kind of like what is actually loaded on a browser. So if you go to a page, and instead of the product page, it shows a big interstitial showing something else, uh, that's kind of the, the usual setup for interstitials. And from our point of view, those kind of interstitials, if they're intrusive interstitials in the sense that they get in the way of the user actually interacting with the page, then that would be something we would consider a negative ranking factor. Uh, so if it's, if it's really a case that when you go to your pages, it just takes a bit, and then your product page pops up, then I wouldn't call those interstitials. Um, maybe use some other word for that. Because if you ask around like in the help forums or elsewhere, and you say, oh, my interstitials, and I want to rank for my interstitials, then probably a lot of people will be confused. Um, seems like Google Images crawls some SVG files in SVG and then some it renders into PNG while serving in the search results. What is the reason for that? Is there a way that we can dictate this behavior for a Google Image crawler? Um, I, I don't know. Um, I, I wasn't aware of the kind of like how, how this is, is happening. Uh, so I'm not 100% not sure what, what exactly you're, you're referring to. Um, my understanding is that w when it comes to images, uh, especially 
the the vector formats like SVG, which don't always have a well-defined size. Uh, what we do internally is we com convert that into a normal pixel image so that we can treat it the same way as we can treat other kinds of images. Uh, that means for all of the, the normal processing internally and all of that. And also, specifically with regards to the thumbnail images that we can show so that we can scale it down uh, using the, the normal pixel scaling functions and get it to the right size and uh, get it into an equal resolution to the other thumbnails that we show. So probably that, that is something that, that is happening there. And that's not something that you can easily change, because we, we kind of have our system set up to deal with uh, pixel-based images. And that's, that's what we would do there. Uh, with regards to kind of the, the next step from there, the uh, expanding of the image when you click on it in the image search results, um, I don't know how that would be handled with regards to SVGs or if we do some kind of in pixel-based uh, bigger preview or SVG-based bigger preview. So I, I don't quite know how we would handle that there. Uh, if you have any examples where this is causing problems, uh, I would love to see them. So feel free to send me anything uh, that you run across in that regard, uh, especially when you see that it's causing weird problems that could be avoided by doing it slightly differently. Uh, is there anything that we can do in terms of SEO to improve user journey? Um, I think those are kind of uh, a separate topics. So it's not something that you would do SEO to improve user journey, but rather you, you have your user journeys that you use uh, to kind of analyze your products and try to find the best, best approaches that you can do there. And then based on that, you would also try to do some SEO to improve things in the search results. So one is kind of improving things for the user, and the other is kind of improving things uh, for search engines. Sometimes if, if things align well, then there is enough overlap that they work together. Uh, but essentially, they're, they're separate topics. Uh, what is the best way to treat syndicated content on my site? Uh, if the content is already in other sites, too, and I have, do I have to no index my page, or do I canonicalize the original source? Do I no follow all in internal links of that page? Um, yeah, good, good question. I, I don't think we have um, exact guidelines on syndicated content. Uh, generally, we, we do recommend using something like a rel canonical to the original source. Uh, I know that's not uh, always possible in all cases. Uh, so uh, sometimes what can happen is we just recognize that there's syndicated content on a website, and then we essentially try to rank that appropriately. Uh, so if if you're syndicating your content to other sites, then it's theoretically possible that those other sites also show up in the search results. It's possible that maybe they even show up above you in the search results, depending on the situation. So that's something to kind of keep in mind if you're syndicating content. If you're hosting syndicated content on your website, uh, then that's kind of similar to, to keep in mind in the sense that most of the time we would try to show the original source. And uh, if just because you have a syndicated version of that content on your site as well doesn't mean we will also show your website in the search results. Uh, so usually what I recommend there is to make sure that you have significant, unique, and compelling content of your own on your website. So if you're using syndicated content to kind of fill out additional facets of information for your users, then that's perfectly fine. I wouldn't expect to rank for those additional kind of uh, facets or filler content that you have there. Um, it can happen, but it's not something I, I would count on. And instead, if for the kind of the SEO side of things, for the ranking side of things, I would really make sure that you have significant uh, kind of unique content of your own so that when our systems look at your website, they don't just see all of this content that everyone else has, but rather they see a lot of additional value that you provide that is not on the other sites as well. Um, when we want to rank for a specific topic on Google, is it a good practice to also cover related topics? Uh, for example, if we sell laptops and we want to rank for that, is it useful to create posts like reviewing laptops, 
the introducing the best new laptops, uh, those kind of things. And if it's useful, then it doesn't have to be done in any special way. Uh, so I think this is always useful, uh, because what you're essentially doing is, on the one hand, for search engines, uh, you're kind of building out your reputation of knowledge on that specific topic area and for users as well. It provides a little bit more context on kind of like why they should trust you. Uh, if they see that you have all of this knowledge on this general topic area and you show that and you kind of present that regularly, then it makes it a lot easier for them to trust you on something very specific that you're also providing on your website. So, that's something where I think that that always kind of makes sense. Uh, and for search engines as well, it's something where if we can recognize that this website is really good for this broader topic area, then if someone is searching for that broader topic area, we, we can try to show that website as well. We don't have to purely focus on individual pages, but we'll say, oh, like it looks like you're looking for a new laptop. Like this website has a lot of information on various facets around laptops. Um, how long should we wait for Search Console manual action response? Uh, it's been months in. I avoided resubmitting because that's not nice. But do these ever get lost? Uh, if we don't get any replies, what should we be doing as a next step? Uh, depending on the type of manual action, it can take quite a bit of time. So in particular, I think uh, the, the link-based manual actions are things that can take uh, quite a bit of time to, to be reviewed properly. And it can happen in some cases that it takes, takes a few months. Uh, so usually what happens is if you resubmit the reconsideration request, then we will drop the second reconsideration request because we think it's a duplicate. Uh, the team internally will still be able to look at it. And if you have additional information there, that's perfectly fine. Uh, if it's essentially just copy and paste of the same thing, then I don't think that changes anything. Um, it's also not the case that you would have a negative effect from resubmitting a reconsideration request. So in particular, if you're not sure that you actually sent the last one, and you're like, oh, it's like someone on my team sent it, and now I'm not sure if they actually sent it or not, then resubmitting it is, is perfectly fine. It's not that there will be kind of an additional penalty for resubmitting the reconsideration request. Uh, it's just. When the team sees that uh, one is still pending, they'll focus on that pending one rather than the additional ones. Um, if you don't see any response with regards to manual actions, specifically around the link manual actions, I would recommend maybe also checking in with the help forums or checking in with other people who have worked on uh, kind of link-based manual actions, um, because because it, when it takes so long to kind of be reprocessed like this, it's something where you really want to make sure that you have everything covered really well. Uh, so that's something where if you're seeing it taking a long time, you're like, oh, I don't know if I needed to do more or needed to do something different, then going to the help forums uh, is a really good way to get additional feedback from people. And it's very likely that you'll go to the help forums and they'll be like, oh, you should have submitted these 500 other things. And it's not the case that you have to do whatever feedback comes back from the help forum, uh, but rather it's, it's additional input to take in, in. And you can review that and say, OK, I will take into account maybe a part of this feedback and maybe skip another part of this feedback. Because the, the folks in the help forum are very experienced with tons of topics, uh, but uh, they don't have the absolute answers. I, I don't think anyone really has that. Uh, so it's, it's, I, I think it's great to get all of this feedback, but you still have to kind of judge it and, and weigh it out yourself, as, as with anything on the internet. Uh, does PageSpeed Insights use the Googlebot? Uh, I wonder, because when I'm looking at the rendered screenshots in PageSpeed Insights, based on our site behavior, it looks like those weren't rendered by Googlebot. Um, you're probably right. Uh, so a, in particular, PageSpeed Insights is something which is based on the, the Chrome setup. Uh, so that's something where. 
Uh, as far as I know, the, the server-based system that uh, does the page speed insights, uh, screenshots, and calculations, and kind of metrics, all of that, is just purely based on Chrome. And uh, Googlebot also uses Chrome to render pages, but there are some kind of unique aspects with regards to Googlebot that don't apply to page speed insights. Uh, for example, robots text. Uh, so when, when Google renders a page, it has to comply with the robot's text of all of the embedded content there. And if you have maybe a CSS file or a JavaScript file blocked by robot's text, we wouldn't be able to process that from Google Block point of view. But PageSpeed Insights would still be able to review that and show that. So that's probably where you're seeing those differences. It's, I, I think the, the difference is more and more blurred because Googlebot does use Chrome as well. So it's, it's very similar. But you can certainly find situations where there are differences. And you can certainly construct situations where there are differences. Like I mentioned, with robots text is, is a really simple way to kind of see those differences. Uh, with regards to the way that we calculate speed uh, for, for search, though, uh, we so kind, kind of, I guess, looking, looking forward at the, the core web vitals, at the moment, I, I don't really know offhand how we do that. But uh, with regards to core web vitals, we use what users actually see. So it's not the case that Googlebot renders a page very quickly and then it gets a good score, or Chrome in PageSpeed Insights renders a page very quickly, therefore it gets a good score. But rather, we look at what users actually saw. And I think that's, that's really important, because that's kind of a measure of what, what the real world performance is. And all of these tools that kind of render it in more of a lab environment, like, like Google, Googlebot when it renders a page, uh, or PageSpeed Insights when it renders a page, is something that is almost more of a prediction than an actual kind of measurement. Because there are lots of assumptions in play there. And whenever you run something like a rendering of a page within a data center, then you have a very different setup than the average user has with regards to network connectivity, with regards to caches, and all of that. It's just very different. Uh, so these tools, when you run them and when you look at the, the measurements that they show, you need to keep in mind this is more of a prediction rather than an actual value that uh, users will see. Sorry. And uh, I'm sorry. I was gonna, no, I was going to ask a follow-up. I'm sorry. You continue. Yeah. I, and and it, it's something that these tools also try to build in in the sense that they will say, well, I run in a data center, but I will act like I have a 3G phone and kind of a slow connection. And they'll try to emulate that, but it's, it's still very different than actual user. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so so um, in terms of assessing it, you know, I, I, was, I was reading a site, seemed like it had a lot of ads. So I decided, OK, let me see how this is scored on page speed insights. And it rendered a score with the circle of uh, 21, which was in the red, not very good. But below that was a visual and um, below that numerical and visual representation was a sentence that read that based on field data, the page passed in green, the, uh, the assessment. And then below that, the measure there were these measurement bars for cumulative layout shift, you know, first input uh, delay, et cetera. And those were all mostly in the Green. So where, where's the disconnect, and what should one be paying attention to, that, that first visual circle or the fact that it says it passed the Core Web Vitals assessment? Um, I, I need to keep in mind like how, how the PageSpeed Insights looked. I, I think it, it, it I has like that one overview, overview score on top, right? Yeah, I, I actually, is there a way to present? Because I. I did a screenshot yeah. and I redacted the name of the, the website if that makes it yeah. easier. So, so I think what, what happens in PageSpeed Insights is we take the various metrics there and we try to calculate like one single number out of that. And uh, sometimes that's useful to, to work on or to give you a rough overview of like what the overall score would be. Uh, but it, it all depends on like how strongly you weigh the individual factors. Uh, so it can certainly be the case that 
overall, when users see a page, it's, it's pretty fast and sleek. But when our systems test it, they're like, oh, well, like, these are some theoretical problems that could be causing issues. And uh, they'll kind of calculate that into the score. Uh, so that I, I think the, the overall score is a really good way to get a rough estimate. And uh, the, the actual field data is a really good way to see like, what people actually see. And usually, uh, what I recommend is using those as a basis to determine, like, should I be focusing on, on improving the speed of a page or not? And uh, then use kind of the uh, lab testing tools out there for kind of determining the individual values and for tweaking them kind of with, with the work that you're doing. So kind of using the overall score and using the field data as a way to determine, like, should I be doing something on this or not? And then using the lab data with the individual tools to improve things and check that you're going in the right direction. Because the, the issue is also the field data is delayed, I think, by about 30 days. Uh, so any changes that you make, and if you're waiting for the field data to update, like it's always 30 days behind. And if you're unsure that you're going in the right direction or that you've improved things enough, then waiting 30 days is kind of annoying. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, John, can I add a follow-up on that as well? Sure. Uh, with regards to see, um, Core Web Vitals, uh, field data is going to be the, the the one to pay attention to, correct? In terms of ranking signals, or is it going to be yes. added? Yes. Okay. Yes. It's the, okay. the field data. Thank you. Oh. While we are in this Core Web Vital topics, I have a small question in this regard. Is that when this becomes a ranking sign off? Um, CLS and all the other friends. Um, is it going to be page level or domain level? Um, good question. I so it's essentially what happens with the the field data is we don't have data points for every page, uh, so we. For, for the most part, we need to have kind of groupings of individual pages. And depending on the amount of data that we have, that can be a grouping of the, the whole website, kind of the domain. Or I think, I think in uh, the Chrome user experience report, they use the origin, which would be the subdomain and the, the protocol uh, there. So that would be kind of the, the overarching kind of grouping. And if we have more data for individual parts of a website, then we'll try to use that. Uh, and I believe that's something you also see in Search Console, where we'll show like one URL and say like there's so many other pages that are associated with that, and that's kind of the the grouping that uh, we would use there. Just uh, why I, I ask this: we have this set of pages that they are slow; they exist for a different purpose than our other pages on the site, and these we have a no index on them. But they are very slow, and that, that's why we don't want it to be accounted for. Yeah, I, I don't think, or I, I don't know for sure, like how how we would do uh, things with a no index there. Uh, but uh, it's it's not something you can easily determine uh, ahead of time. Like, will we see this as one website, or will we see it as like different groupings there? Uh, sometimes with the Chrome user experience report data, you can see, like, do, does Google have data points for those no index pages? Uh, does Google have data points for the other pages there? And then you can kind of figure out, like, OK, it can recognize that there are separate kinds of pages and can treat them individually. And if that's the case, then I, I don't see a problem with that. Uh, if it's a, a smaller website where we just don't have a lot of signals for the website, then those no index pages could be playing a role there as well. So my understanding, like I, I'm not 100 percent sure, but my understanding is that in the Chrome user experience report data, uh, we we do include all kinds of pages that users access. So not there's no specific kind of will this page be indexed like this or not check that happens there because the indexability is sometimes quite complex with regards to. Uh, canonicals and and all of that, 
Uh, so it's not trivial to determine kind of on the Chrome side if this page will be indexed or not. It might be the case that uh, if, if a page uh, has a clear no index, that we, then even in Chrome we would be able to recognize that. But I'm, I'm not 100% sure if we actually do that. All right, thank you. I'll follow up on, it on sure. Twitter. Yeah, I, I would also check uh, the, the Chrome user experience report data. I think you can download that into BigQuery, and you can play with that a little bit and figure out like how, how is that happening for other sites, uh, for similar sites that kind of fall in the same category as, as the site that you're working on. Cool. More questions from any of you? Yes, John, hi. Hi. Um, I suddenly see, so, well, uh, so, um, it started all at the mid of January. I suddenly saw in Search Console that there are a lot of uh, old URLs popping up, especially in the 404 uh, subcategory under excluded and in the uh, URL inspection tool. These old URLs are, for example, old HTTP versions of, uh, U of URLs. And it's even uh, old domains, because the websites were moved to a new domain like three years ago. So my question is, um, why is that? Should I be worried? And if yes, how can I fix it? So these are showing up as 404 errors, or? These are showing up as 404 errors, and for some uh, for some URLs, if I use the URL inspection tool, they also show up as referrers in um, in the in the URL inspection tool. Okay, um, I I think if they're just shown as 404s, I I would completely ignore that. Um, what what happens in our systems is that uh, pages which are 404 are essentially still tracked on our side. And from time to time, we will double check to see that they still have a 404. And uh, that can happen like that, that a site is like has changed significantly, doesn't have these pages for years now. And still, from time to time, our systems say, well, we, we will double check those old URLs and see if they still return 404. And that's not a sign that anything is stuck with those pages. It's just kind of our, our systems trying to make sure that we're not missing anything from your website. Mm -hmm. And if they show up as, as uh, referring URLs in the URL inspection tool? So, so how do you mean as re referring URLs? Like that for they link to another page, or? Yes, for example, I uh, use the URL inspection tool on a URL that's still present. And then in the URL inspection tool, you see uh, where Google knows this page from. And there it says, for, uh, for example, it knows it from the sitemap. And then there are like four, U four URLs uh, listed below that. And in that list, uh, this list contains, for example, an old HTTP version. It contains the same, uh, the same file name, but from the old URL of the website which are all URLs that don't exist any, anymore. So this is also something that that's, makes me worry, or, yeah. or shouldn't it? That's, that's completely normal, yeah. Uh, that's something where I, I'm not 100% sure like, which, which data we show there in Search Console, but we have a concept of um, kind of the, the first seen location of a link to, to a specific page. Ah, okay. and, uh, like, we, we might have seen that URL from that page at some point way in the past. And if that page doesn't exist anymore, it's still like, this is where we first saw it. OK, so it's basically just make sure that if uh, the original page doesn't exist anymore, it returns a proper 404. If it's redirected, then make sure it's a proper redirect. And in other cases, just uh, ignore it. If yeah, I get that exactly. Right. Yeah. So usually, if you if you have an older website, then over the years you will collect more and more of these 404 pages, and our systems, even when they rarely check a 404 page, uh, it's just like the amount of URLs that could be returning 404 grows. Uh, so if you look at okay. your your server statistics and you look at like what Googlebot is requesting, then 
it can look like, oh, Google is spending so much time on 404s. But it's for us, it's just checking it maybe once a year or so. But uh, because we have so many that we check once a year, it like overall looks like a lot. But okay, that's yes, this web. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sir. This website is like 10, 10 years old. So. Yeah. Uh, and uh, last question for that, because the websites I'm talking about, they were also moved to new domains. We used the, um, uh, the address change tool. And so basically, just make sure that the old domain still redirects to the, uh, to the new website. This would be then the perfect, the yeah. good setup, and we shouldn't worry about anything, anything yeah. further. Yeah. I, that's, that, that sounds great. Um, the w one place where people also get confused with uh, with that, which is kind of similar, I guess, with with old URLs, is that when we recognize that pages have moved, we still have some association of the old location. Uh, so we will know that this page on the new website used to be located in as a page on the old website in some sense. Uh, so if in the search results you do a site query for the old domain, then even after a couple of years, you'll still see a lot of URLs that are shown there. And it's not the case that we have them indexed there, but rather we know they used to be there. And it looks like a user is explicitly looking for the old location, so we'll show them. Uh, so if you look at the cached version of the page in, in a case like that, then you'll see that actually it shows a new, new domain. So it's, it's a little bit confusing if you look at it like that. Uh, but essentially, it should be working uh, properly. OK, thank you. Sure. So um, I have a related question. For example, if you said the proper 301s redirects, and uh, I was just trying to understand the relation in, of pay backlinks uh, with the ones, you know, if Google has the history of the old links, uh, is it possible that it, it passes some sort of page rank to um, new URLs that we, we set 301 redirects for? Uh, for example, we have a site, you know, with the backlinks, and we decided to change the URL. And with the proper trees or ones, and uh, you know, backlinks are always there. We we normally change a few of those, but they are they're still there. So if you say you know Google has some sort of history there, so would that possible that it passes some sort of rank juice or page rank juice to new URLs? Yes, yes. So um, it's essentially, what happens there is we, we will have kind of the old URL on your website that has some signals from the links that go to the old URL. And we have the new URL on your website. And uh, with the, a redirect, you're basically telling us these are equivalent, and you'd probably prefer the new URL to be shown. Uh, so what we will do is we will put both of those URLs from your website into a, a group and say, this is kind of a group of URLs that have kind of collected signals. And then with the redirect, we will pick usually the, the destination URL and say, this is the canonical for that group. And the canonical page will then kind of inherit all of the signals that go to that group. Uh, so if there are links to the old version of a page, if there are links to a copy of that page, then all of that will be kind of combined together in the canonical version. Uh, so that's something that kind of gets gets passed on there. Uh, when specifically when you're talking about site moves, we still recommend making sure that you, as much as possible, can update the old links anyway, um, because what what happens there is we will put those URLs in the same group, kind of like I mentioned. Uh, but we use various factors that determine which of these URLs is the right one to show, which one is the canonical one. And redirect is one factor, but also links are another factor. So if all of the links, like internal and external links, go to the old version of your URL and you redirect to a new version, we might pick the old version of the URL to show in search. Uh, so that's something kind of to, to keep in mind, that if you want to move everything to a new URL, then make sure that 
everything is aligned with the new URL. So the redirect, the sitemap files, the internal linking, uh, as much as possible also the external linking, uh, so that everything just fits together with that new kind of URL that you want. Yeah, John? thanks for this question. Um, I have another question. Uh, you know, most of the um, tools, um, the SEO checkup tools, they, they pop up with a warning which says um, low text to HTML ratio, which means code is you know, uh, more than you know, the original text. Uh, would it be something we need to worry about, or uh, is it OK for Google to uh, pick the right text? We, we don't have a notion of text to HTML ratio for search. Uh, so that's something where I think a lot of these tools are able to calculate this, and they think, oh, it's worthwhile showing. But it's not, it's not an SEO ranking factor kind of thing. Uh, the, there are two places where it could play a role. On the one hand, uh, with regards to speed. Uh, so if you have a lot of HTML and you have very little text, then obviously we have to load a lot of uh, content to display the page. So that's like one small factor. Uh, the other one is with regards to extreme situations where you have a lot and lot of HTML and very little text. Uh, we, we have limits with regards to what the, the maximum page size is that we would download for an HTML page. And I think that's in the order of, I don't know, hundreds of megabytes, something like that. So if you have an HTML page that has hundreds of megabytes of HTML and very little text in it, then yes, that could be playing a role. But that's something that I, I suspect is extremely rare. And if you have that problem, then that's, that's like a bigger problem than just like, oh, it's like not perfect HTML to text ratio. Perfect. Yeah, I got that. Thank you. Sure. Um, let me just pause the recording here. Uh, you're, you're welcome to, to stick around a little bit longer if you like, but it's, it's always good to kind of keep the recording li limited to uh, avoid it becoming super long. Uh, thank you all for joining. Thanks for all of the questions that were submitted and that were asked from you along the way. And uh, I'll set up the, the next office hours probably later today, which will also be next Friday, but uh, evening European time more for the, the American folks. Uh, so Michael doesn't have to get up in the middle of the night. Um, I don't know how he does it, but thank you. Um, Cool. All right. Let me just pause here, and we can continue after that.